Hi. In today's video, I wanted to cover a couple of topics associated with my smart control board, which I developed quite a while ago now, uh, and I have done many videos on this on my channel. Uh, in particular, we're going to be looking at the trailing edge dimmers, first of all, and these are some modules that plug into this smart board, and these trailing edge dimmers are designed to control mains type LED lamps that turn on at the zero crossing point on the AC waveform and then get turned off at some point later. Uh, that's the type of waveform that these LED lamps are designed for. Now, this is my original design that uses a pair of series MOSFETs to allow us to control an AC waveform with a signal from a microcontroller on the main board. And the output is fully isolated from everything else on the board using a isolated DC to DC converter an opto-isolated gate driver and also an opto-isolator here to detect the zero crossing point on the AC waveform. And this design has been working really well but I recently repaired a commercially available dimmer switch and they used a slightly different switching arrangement which used an IGBT combined with a bridge rectifier to do that AC switching. And so I built up a board based up around that design uh, very similar to the original design but replacing some of the components on the main side and first of all we're going to be comparing these two designs with a mains load first of all an incandescent lamp and then the led lamp and see how the two behave and also see how the losses are between the two different designs right so we've got the board hooked up to the picoscope 5000 series and we're also using some probes here to assist with probing the main side of things. So first of all, we're looking at the voltage across the lamp, so across pins 3 and 4. We're looking at the current through the lamp, so in series with pin 3. We're also looking at the gate waveform just here, and we're also looking at the gate drive into the whole driver circuit. Right, so here we are in Picoscope 7 Early Access, and I've set up the four channels here, so AC out to the lamp, the gate drive, the PWM signal in from the microcontroller, and then also the current measurement. And we're able to configure each of these channels. Um, so we can go into here, click on the probes, and you can see I've set up a custom probe for the times 200 diff probe. Uh, similarly on the current, I've set up a custom probe for that CP2100B, very easy to set up with the custom scaling. You can set any Y equals MX type curve for your probes. So let's apply a bit of current to the lamp. So we'll turn on the lamp at about 10% duty or something like that. And there we can see some waveforms. Now, what you saw briefly there was really quite a large spike on the yellow channel, which is the current into the lamp. And that was the filament in the lamp warming up. Initially, it takes quite a lot of current to drive the lamp uh, since it's an incandescent load and then the current started to decrease and as we increase the duty cycle you'll see more like a sine wave as we increase that and the current actually goes down the peak current because the lamp itself is warming up. Now I am running this through an isolation transformer as well which is why we're getting a bit of distortion on the sine wave but you can pretty much see what's going on so in green we've got the PWM waveform coming from uh, the microcontroller. We've got the gate waveform and then we've got the blue and the yellow channels which are the voltage outs and the current out to the lamp. And one thing that you will also notice is that since this is an incandescent load we have a perfect power factor so the current and the voltage are perfectly in phase with each other. I've now replaced the incandescent lamp for the LED replacement and the first thing you'll notice is the current waveform is significantly smaller. Before we were seeing currents in excess of four or five hundred milliamps and now we're seeing that at about 66 milliamps. So quite a lot less current which is as expected because these LED lamps are intended to save energy so they use a lot less power. The other thing you'll notice in contrast to the incandescent lamp is the peak of the voltage waveform is not in line with the peak of the current waveform. And if you remember the acronym CIVIL, which is used to recall whether current leads or lags voltage in a capacitive or an inductive AC circuit, what you'll remember from that is basically that since this is a capacitive load, the current leads the voltage. And that does present its own problems for the network, so if everyone swaps to these lamps, we will see some imperfect power factors for each household, which has to be dealt with in other ways. 
Now as an aside, one nice feature about this Picoscope 5000 series is we're able to change the resolution at the expense of sample rate and since we're dealing with fairly low frequencies here we can make that trade off. So you can see all the quantization going on here since we've only got an 8-bit signal to represent this entire window. However if we increase the resolution we now get a lot more detail and we're able to see the signals quite a lot more clearly. So one really nice feature there about the Picoscope 5000. So I've just set up the thermal camera and I've also replaced the lamp for the incandescent one once again with the brightness at about halfway. Now first of all this hotspot here are the two resistors that are feeding the optocoupler for the zero crossing detection. Now this is one part of the circuit that I'm still not entirely happy with and I think I might come up with a different method for the zero crossing detection rather than just burning some of the power in these resistors. But what we've got here is the two MOSFETs here and as I mentioned the power dissipation in these should be about 160 milliwatts and the lamp has been on for about 10 minutes and we're not seeing a significant increase past about 33 degrees C here. Now considering the board is sitting there at 28 degrees that's a 5 degree temperature rise which I don't think is anything really to worry about. So pretty low dissipation in the two MOSFETs. Right so we put in the new PCB with the IGBT and bridge rectifier and taking a look at the schematic this time I think we've got quite a few more losses so the voltage between collector and emitter when the transistor is saturated in the data sheet says 1.8 volts or so and then we always have two diodes on the bridge rectifier conducting and at this kind of load 400 milliamps we're seeing about 0.7 volts drop across each diode so that's 1.4 volts dropped across the bridge rectifier which in total is 3.2 volts drop which if we calculate that for that 400 milliamp load then we're going to be dissipating about 1.28 watts in this circuit here 720 milliwatts in the IGBT and 560 milliwatts in the bridge rectifier which is quite a lot and um, I think I've read that correctly from the data sheet so we'll take a look at the thermal images we should see this warming up quite a lot more um, but I haven't tested this board at all yet so this is going to be the first go as well so hopefully we don't see anything go wrong Right, so let's turn it on. And we're getting a really nice clean waveform there. So everything looks good. In red we've got the gate drive and that's a nice clean stable waveform. Uh, the green is the PWM into the board. We've got the blue voltage waveform to the lamp and then the current waveform in yellow. And at the moment that current's a little bit high because the lamp is not at full brightness so the resistance is a little bit lower than it is at full brightness. If we increase it up to full brightness we should see this drop and we do. So that's it running at full power about 560 milliamps but as we decrease the brightness of the lamp we start to see the peak current rising up and what you'll also see is those two waveforms as before are perfectly in phase but that looks like a really decent waveform. Now I'm just looking at the thermal imager and we are seeing some temperature increase already. If I increase the lamp to full brightness we're definitely seeing some thermal dissipation. We didn't have temperatures like this with the dual MOSFET design. You can see the bridge rectifier creeping up in temperature. Now these will be fine up to 85, probably a little bit higher. Um, any higher than that really in the junction, particularly of the transistor, is going to be quite a lot more. This is a plastic package. But we'll leave this for 5 or 10 minutes and just see what this stabilizes at. Right, so it's been about 10 minutes and I haven't seen the temperature increase any further than this so we're basically sitting around 56 degrees C on the bridge rectifier and about 52 degrees C on the IGBT. Surprisingly the bridge rectifier is getting warmer so maybe my calculations were slightly off but definitely we're seeing some higher dissipation on this board compared to the dual MOSFET design. Uh, don't worry about this resistor, this is just a current limiting resistor into an LED that's lit up there from a 12 volt supply. And obviously once again we've got the um, two resistors for the zero crossing detection which are dissipating a bit of power sitting at 60 degrees C. So we've got the LED lamp in the lamp holder now and we can see the waveforms looking very similar to the original dual MOSFET design. The current into the lamp has dropped down to about 50 milliamps and everything's looking pretty clean. Now there is a little bit of distortion here as you can see. I think this is due to the isolation transformer more than anything else. It doesn't like these fast edges uh, because it doesn't have a particularly low impedance. 
If I plug this into the mains, I'm pretty sure this would disappear. But this is an indication of the kind of distortion that we're introducing into the mains network by dimming these type of LED lamps. And also, as you can see, the power factor again off. So the peak of the voltage waveform here, but we've got this very distorted looking current waveform with the peak over here, uh, but still drawing current all the way down to this point here. So really these LED lamps are not great, uh, but the circuit itself seems to be working fine. With the LED lamp, we're looking at barely any temperature increase on the PCB. It's going up to about 32 degrees C on the IGBT and the bridge rectifier, uh, but nothing really too concerning there as expected. We're dealing with much lower currents now. So I've just quickly connected the differential probe across the dimmer switch. So basically this is measuring the voltage drop across the dimmer. And in blue, we're looking at the voltage drop here. Now with the LED lamp, we're seeing about two volts dropped across the dimmer switch. Uh, on each half of the AC waveform. Now I calculated about 3.2 volts drop when we use the incandescent lamp, so let's take a look at that. And so here's the incandescent lamp and we're looking at about 2.5 volts drop. Now it looks like the PicoScope software makes it really nice and easy for us to do maths on any of the waveforms and probably more capable maths than many of the other oscilloscopes on the market, so we can do loads of stuff here. Uh, what we're doing is very simple, just the AC drop times the current, which is basically the power being dissipated on the dimmer switch. Uh, and then I've just set the colour to purple and called it A times D because we're multiplying the A channel by the D channel. And that is giving us a peak power dissipation of about 1.3 watts. Now we can also still do measurements on top of the math, so we're looking at the RMS of that and it looks like the RMS power dissipation is just slightly under one watt with that 100 watt lamp in circuit. So yeah, about one watt, that seems to make sense for the temperature increase that we're seeing on the PCB. So now repeating the same thing with the MOSFET base driver, we can see that the losses are considerably lower. So in blue, we've got the voltage dropped across the dimmer switch, which is only about 0 0.53 volts peak. Uh, power dissipation peak is about 245 milliwatts and then the RMS at the bottom is only 150 milliwatts. So very, very low power dissipation in our dimmer switch when we use the dual MOSFET design. So our new dimmer PCB seems to be working really nicely, uh, but what we did see there is a reduced efficiency when using this particular board. With that 100 watt load, we're dissipating about one watt in the PCB. So it's 99% efficient, but not as good as the dual MOSFET design. So that looks like everything's working nicely with the AC dimmers. And this main board is also designed to work with other plug-in modules. And one of those is this very simple relay module, which just allows us to turn AC loads on and off. And I want to integrate this into the system uh, that I'm using in my bathroom at the moment. And in the UK, at least, it's very common to have extractor fans in the bathroom to extract the humid air when you're having a shower and that kind of thing. But these are typically wired into the lighting circuit. And so every time someone goes in the bathroom and turns the light on, these fans turn on. And in particular, in the winter months, uh, you're going to be extracting heated air from the house that then has to be replenished and reheated by the central heating system, which costs money. And we'll look at that in a moment. But I would like to address that problem by using this main control board. Now, many years ago, I designed a humidity and temperature sensor, uh, which is quite discreet looking. It actually has an LED display which can shine through this front panel here. It has an RS-485 interface and it's powered from a 24 volt supply, the same as this PCB. We've got an RS-485 interface on here. Uh, but I've just been using this for some very basic control. I've never interfaced the two boards together. So I've been working on the firmware on here. And today, uh, I also want to try and use the PicoScope to check that we're getting the correct communications between these two PCBs. But first of all, let's just have a look at my rationale behind using this, as opposed to just the very basic timer fans that we often use in the UK. Now, do correct me if my maths is wrong here. Uh, but based on these fans that I have installed in our shower rooms, uh, the average amount of airflow based on the figures from the data sheet is going to be somewhere around 217.5 meters cubed per hour. And in a winter month, if it's 5 degrees C outside and we have our central heating thermostat set to 20 degrees C indoors, 
we've got a delta T of about 15 degrees C. So every time someone uses the bathroom, we then have to reheat that amount of air by 15 degrees C because we tend to have thermostats on our central heating system. So we can work out the amount of energy required to heat that volume of air by 15 degrees C and therefore the amount of energy to do that is going to be 686 kilojoules or about 0.19 kilowatt hours. And worst case people are heating their house with electricity which at the moment is somewhere around 25 pence a kilowatt hour so every time someone uses the bathroom it's costing about five pence uh, just to replenish the heat that has been lost and then let's say someone uses it 10 times a day then that's 50 pence every day and for one month that's 15 pounds so that's actually quite a lot of uh, energy that is wasted just by blowing air outside now you can obviously get humidistat based fans but they're normally quite basic in control so they tend to have just a threshold setting uh, usually between 60% and 95%, something like that, and you set it to whatever you want between those two numbers, and basically the fan will turn off if the humidity exceeds that number, and turn off if it drops below. However, those controls are not that useful because uh, usually you want to get your room quite dry after having a shower to avoid damp issues, but you also don't want it to trigger and leave the fan running all day if it happens to be a particularly humid day outside for example. So what I'm hoping to do is a more adaptive algorithm on this PCB that takes into account day-to-day -day variations in the humidity in the room and is actually just looking for the rapid increase in humidity when someone has the shower on. So after we've got all of this working we're going to be leaving this system logging for a while just to see how uh, the day-to-day -day variations occur and what the waveforms look like when someone uses the shower and then I can revisit this and come up with some kind of algorithm for it. So sadly it's not quite as straightforward as just plugging it together and it all working. We can see we get the blinking TX light here so it's sending data out on the bus but the RX light isn't flashing so it doesn't seem to be getting anything back. Right so we'll hook up the Picoscope to the RS485 bus just on the non-inverting channel so this should look like the RS232 data and we'll go to uh, Picoscope 7. So there we go we have some waveforms there and we're definitely getting both parts of the comm so we're getting the transmit and also the receive. Uh, interestingly the transmit part is quite low in amplitude which doesn't quite make sense. We should be having about 3 volts there like we see on the return signal. So uh, let's put the serial decoder on. Uh, there's quite a lot of serial decoders on here uh, that come with the software. So RS232 but we've got all of these available to us. Uh, channel 1. We'll set the threshold to 1.25 volts. Uh, we're using 9 data bits here and the board rate is 250 kiloboard and that's all correct and that's all fine so now if we start that running so yeah all of the data looks correct there we've got the data frame saying I'm looking to see what's there on channel 1 then a, a length byte which is 0 because there's no further data and then we're getting the response back from the sensor, 101, six bytes of data, and then all of the data and the checksum. So everything there looks correct. So uh, interestingly, we're not receiving anything actually at the UART on the PIC. So first of all, we'll look at the TX data, um, but that was looking correct. So that's the data from the PIC, uh, 0 to 3.3, so that's all good. And the RX on the RS-485 transceiver. Ah, it's just reading complete garbage. So one thing that I noticed, first of all, is the um, signal levels were quite low on the signal coming from this PCB. And I think I just spotted the problem. It says operates from a single 5 volt supply. Uh, we're running this on 3.3 volts. Uh, so let's have a quick look at the specs. Uh, supply voltage, yeah, 4.75 to 5.25. So there is a good chance we are just not able to run this particular chip on this PCB. I can't see anything else wrong. 
So I think it might just be a simple case of swapping out this part. Let's try again. Aha, there we go. So we should now be getting data. You can see we're now transmitting data on this bus here. And you might just be able to see the RX light flashing here as well. So it looks like that's all working. Let's dim the lights down a bit. Yeah, you can see the... Well, the green's quite a lot brighter, but the amber light is flashing there on the RX line as well. So that's good. So let's just double check uh, what the bus looks like now, because those voltage levels were a bit concerning. Let's check this has fixed it. And so, yeah, that's much more like it. So this is actually on the RS485 bus, and we're getting amplitude between 0 0.5 and about 3 volts, which is what we're expecting there. And if we look on the data line that we were previously seeing all that noise on, that's now a good clean signal, 0 to 3.3 volts. So we're receiving that data properly. Uh, I do need to change that other chip. Right, so I've replaced the other transceiver, and I plan to feed this directly into a laptop just using a normal FT232 transceiver. We can do that by just using the non-inverting channel here on the output here. Let's have a quick look at the uh, Picascope software again. So yeah, we're getting a good 0 to 3.3 volt signal, as you can see. Um, we're also getting some varying data. Now, we're getting loads of framing errors and stuff like that because the board rate's all set wrong. This was for our previous connection. This second UART is set for a different board rate. So we've set it to 115200 board. Uh, only eight data bits this time. And we'll look at the ASCII because we're actually outputting ASCII directly here so that we can uh, read the data a bit more easily. So as you can see, it's decoding the data fine now. No red uh, marks around here, so the framing is all correct. And we've got the table here, which shows all of our data coming in. So we're reading T, 2452, which means the temperature is 24.52 degrees. And then comma H, comma 4107, and a carriage return and a line feed. So humidity is 41.07% carriage return line feed, and then we've got our next frame of data. And we're able to export this into various file formats. And we've also got the data to text as well. So really nice that we can put all of the data here in a table. It's separa separating out the buffer numbers as well, based on what we've got displayed on the screen here. So we can separate out the data uh, and we can process out the data should we want to. So a really nice feature there of the PicoScope 7 software. So some really useful debugging there for this project that I'm working on, uh, in particular using the PicoScope 5000 series of MSOs, and also a look at the PicoScope 7 software, which I think is a really nice piece of software. It looks very modern, uh, really quite usable, and as you saw, has some great features, including the serial decoding, where all the options are included as standard, which is normally quite an expensive option on some of the other oscilloscopes. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, any thoughts or comments, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. And until next time, thanks for watching.